Good morning, everyone, and welcome along to the Strategic Daily Farm webinar for today. Um, just meeting our speaker. We are joined very kindly by Wallace and James Hendry and Dave Gilbert. We're going to be talking about spring calving and how to improve fertility for it today. Um, our SDF host farmers are based in Ayrshire, Scotland. They'll give us a little bit of background on what they've been up to and who they are. A little bit of housekeeping for today. For those of you listening live, um, you will all be muted, but please ask questions throughout. How you can ask a question, click on the orange box in the top right hand side of your screen and it will show uh, a control panel where you can see questions and type in your questions, send it in and we'll try and answer as we go through. Please ask questions to both Wallace, James and Dave throughout. Also, if you're collecting Dairy Pro points, please put your name, email and postcode in the chat box as well. And we have also the first few slides you might have seen had been the as the HDB change strategy have your say. There will be a link sent out with the email after the webinar. So please join in, say what you're wanting, challenge HDB, and yeah, make it work for you. I'd like to now move on to today. We have very kindly got James and Wallace Hendry again back on the screen and they will be delving into the fertility in their spring block here today. They've been very open about everything and there's lots of information that they've shared with us so thank you very much for that guys. We also have Dave Gilbert from down south. <laughs> Dave is a vet at Dairy Insight and he will be our technical guy for today and hopefully giving us all some pointers on where to look and how to how to improve what we're doing. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sophie Brewster. I work for AHDB Dairy in Scotland. My main role is knowledge exchange. So anything that you're wanting to know, wanting to do, improve, please get in touch. You pay your levy. We're here for you and yeah, look forward to working together. Can I move on to the objectives for today? We are hopefully going to help you increase your understanding of fertility data, what you collect, how you use it and the factors that affect it. Dave will also help us <laughs> look at the improved recording and the use of data and how that, you know, get results on farm. Then we'll have a really good focus for the Hendry brothers, give them a bit of an action plan at Millen's targets, practicalities and where they can improve to get better results. So moving on for timings, we're going to start with an update from Wallace and James. Then they're going to give us an overview of their system for those of you who maybe haven't found out bit about them beforehand and also what they've been up to since October when they had their first launch, launch meeting. We'll then hand over to Dave. Dave will be focusing all on fertility today. Fertility targets, I'll give a little bit of an intro on what his job role is and what he does. We'll have a little poll in there as well so we can get to know our audience who we're talking to and what you guys are kind of wanting out of today. And finally we will round up with a, an overview of what's happening at Millens, uh, get right into the detail of their fertility targets, where they want to be, where they are just now, and hopefully have a little bit of a focus on how they can improve the upcoming breeding season that's imminent. So yes, hopefully everything will go to plan today. If anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat, ask throughout, and by one o'clock we'll get wrapped up and we'll get some lunch. Thank you. Can I hand over to Wallace and James now, please? You're on mute. Still on mute. <laughs> She's muted. Hey. It was a nasty organizer muted as it wasn't. Yeah, no, it's uh, yeah. okay. <laughs> All right. So uh obviously uh end of October, just probably just after the meeting, the cows came in the house. So the Netherland herd moved to Aird and we milked there to just up to Christmas time. Um and similar to Millens, they kind of come in just about beginning of November. Uh, so the focus since then really has been just sort of probably drying off the leaner cows. Um they're gonna calve first. Um so we kind of Proceeded that probably through December and then uh, right through to Christmas time. Um, doing a bit of selective dry cow therapy, obviously, teat sealant and uh, dry cow tubes um, on uh, some or most of the cows. Um, we've been thinking a wee bit about sort of transition diets. We've been having a talk with Dave, obviously, already about that. So 
um, we've been adding a bit of hay, uh, and today we're very good at making crap hay in Ayrshire, so certainly after last summer, so we've been adding a bit of that into a lot of the, dry, the further out dry cow diets just to sort of provide a bit more fibre into their diet. And, and they were putting on just a wee bit too much condition, so we needed to edge them back a bit through that uh, period. Um, probably what else we've um, done, um, sort of vaccination, the first set of vaccinating for... Um, rotavirus. Rotavirus, which covers us for um, E. coli. E. coli and coronavirus as well. Oh, cool, yeah. so the cows are all right. Um, uh, so we've done that. Uh, we've just finished the first section of TB in there at the start of the week. There, we'll do the second set, and then we'll get into the um, lepto and uh, BVD vaccines uh, by the end of the week. And then we're sort of ready for starting into calving. So all the calving sheds are all ready. They were all mucked out um, and washed out before Christmas time. Um, getting rid of the autumn cows out that out these sheds uh, and clean them out. Um, we've put a bit, obviously, the disinfectant about the sheds from the gates. Um, put a bit of sand in the bottom of the beds. One of the sheds hasn't got a solid floor on it, that kind of thing. Um, so just really getting everything ready for calving, really. Make sure we're ready to go. Um, staff communication. Sophie's goes into that. So we've been doing a few workshops with that, which has been interesting to say yep, the least yep, because yep. we get all our sort of personal profiles done so it lets you know yep. what your attitude to life is but it, uh, we've maybe had a bit of you know some of the staff as well are getting into that some are more into it than others but i think it will improve things at the end of the day because yep. communication has been a problem so yeah i think it'll be a help yeah and i've discovered telepathy is not as good as it as it's supposed to be just doesn't work. No, it's not great. I thought it did as well. It was yeah, wonderfully it was, funny. Uh, yeah. It's doing fine. Um, on that, your staff are all, this is the first lot of work with that have been really positive about who they work for, how they work. So you're doing a, you're doing an all right job, guys. Um, just for anyone who's listening who doesn't know exactly your system, can you just explain that you don't just have Springbok Cabin? Just give a quick overview of the whole system for us, please. And then we'll move yeah. on to you. Well, no, it's not just uh, it's not just a spring block. We also have an autumn block as well, which is uh, 300 cows, and they're housed uh, down at another site, Borough Farm, and they uh, were just finished there just now. The bulls will come out on Monday. That same had their 12 weeks, and uh, the two systems complement ourselves quite well. And then it, uh, we've also had uh, fertility issues there as well. Last year, I had a 23% empty rate. We've made a few improvements this year, and I'm, I'll, I don't just know if that's been very effective yet, but uh, hopefully things things will have improved when it comes to, to PD time this year, but we'll find out soon enough. We've probably been um, doing more scanning earlier this year, so yeah, probably it's, uh, 35 days once a week doing scanning a bit more regularly. Just to try and get a handle on where we are with the eye and you know how effective is with the eye and being light, and that is my reason behind that. But trying to do a bit more PD and earlier on. And you're, you're always finding problems a wee bit early. You always get one or two yeah. that you can just uh, you know maybe see that. You know if it's going to get one or two more cows and calf, it's always it's always a help, like. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. And again, if anyone who's listening has any questions, just please pop them through and we'll try and answer them. Dave, are you quite happy if we hand over to you now? And I put you in mute as well, sorry. <laughs> That's it. Can't hear you, Dave. Can't hear Dave. Can you hear me now? Yay, that's us. We're back. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Welcome having the Dave. same struggles the guys nice. were. So let me just uh, let me just share my screen with everybody. Just bear with me. So let me get my slideshow up. Sorry to look as slightly unprofessional as I'm doing this. Okay, Sophie, can you see that? 
Yeah, we can see it and we can see you, but you'll just be able to see your own screen now. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Okay, guys, so good morning, everybody. Um, uh, so I should probably start off by introducing myself. So my name's Dave. Um, I'm a vet. It doesn't necessarily qualify me to, uh, to speak intelligently about fertility. Um, uh, so why am I talking to you today? I spend a lot of time working with some fairly uh, high performing spring block carvers and autumn block carvers as well. Um, I suppose I've been qualified as a vet now for about 15 years and I've been lucky through that time to work with um, quite a large number of block carved herds. Um, and that's really where I've picked up the things I'll talk to you about today, just through working with some really good operators. Um, I currently work uh, in sort of Cheshire, Staffordshire, Shropshire area, which is a reasonable hotbed of spring block carving. But I formerly worked in the southeast of England, where there's an awful lot of uh, quite tight autumn block carvers. So I guess that's a bit of my background. Um, and I currently split my time between uh, three businesses just to keep myself out of mischief. Um, so I do a lot of consultancy work for organisations like AHDB. Um, we have a, a dairy practice on the Cheshire Plains, which looks after about 15,000 dairy cows. And um, I'm also a senior lecturer at Harper Adams University teaching farm animal health. Um, so today, um, I'm going to be mainly focusing on spring block carving fertility uh, or block carving fertility. I've, there probably are some differences there between autumn and spring units. So I will mainly be focusing on spring units. But if there's any autumn carvers out there um, who've got sort of specific questions that they feel, you know, they want to ask, I, I can sort of bridge across. It's not a problem. Um, I know that Sophie just wanted to get a bit of a scale from everybody as to the type of units we've got out there. So do you want to run that poll now, Sophie, and, and just establish sort of what sort of proportion of um, block carvers we've got to all year round or, or spread block, car okay. block carvers? Yeah, the poll's up just now. So for those of you watching live, can you please click on what your current carving system is? So what is your current carving system? Spring block, autumn block, dual block, or all year round? Um, and we'll just give it a little minute for some results to come in, and then we will, Dave will tell you who your audience is today. That's spring block, autumn block, dual block, all year round. Oh, there we go. That's the results in. So 48% of the audience spring block. We have 8% autumn, 15% dual block, and 30% year round. So we've got a nice, a nice mix there for you, Dave. So it might have some interesting questions. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, now that I know who I'm speaking to, um, today is going to be predominantly focused for you block carvers out there, but a lot of the principles I've discussed today will be, you know, should still carry across to uh, you all year round guys. Um, so, so I suppose if I, if I just sort of uh, outline what we're going to cover today, I'm going to start off with getting our head in the right space, just thinking about why, um, what the targets are and why they are our targets when we're block carving cows. Uh, so why that it's critical that we hit those numbers. I'm going to spend a little bit of time just focusing in on those targets and what they mean. Um, and, and then really, um, the work I've done with James and Wallace so far, and what I'm going to focus on today, is, is going to be around how we might assess the performance of our own units. So I've been spent a long time working with block carvers. Most of you guys who've been at this for a while are well aware of what we should be achieving and are generally reasonably aware of what's important to deliver that. So things like body condition management that Wallace has already talked about there, things like heat detection. Um, but one of the things we sometimes get wrong 
is when we've got to the end of the breeding season and the performance isn't quite what we'd aspired to, is sort of working out where our problems are um, and then looking at solutions to address those. So what we're going to focus on today, there's going to be a lot of graphs. I know you all love a bit of mathematics. Um, uh, but what we're really going to be focusing on today is how we break apart our fertility performance, identify our strengths and weaknesses, and therefore sort of come up with an action plan or a target list for the following season, which is what I've hopefully done for Wallace and James here, um, of areas we need to work on to drive performance moving forward. So we start off with why is fertility important on a block carving system? Well, we can talk about this very technically. We can talk about it in sort of a list of different areas. So for most of you, this will be about a low input, low output system and maximizing the utilization of, of, of forage, of grazed grass. Um, again, for a lot of people, um, there are quite uh, some quite in, intangible benefits there about the ability to focus on one job at a time and therefore execute that job well before you move on to the next job. I know for a lot of all year round carvers, the, the fact that you've constantly got carving cows, dry cows, calves, heat detection, it, it can be quite distracting um, and you can feel pulled in different directions, which can be a benefit of, of block carving systems. And again, you know, it can help with the simplification of workflow and labor. Milk production is obviously a key factor, and we can talk about that, you know, generally in the spirit that for any dairy herd, getting cows carved down regularly is the key to efficient milk production. Uh, but again, for a lot of block calving herds, particularly spring block calving herds, because we may have limited housing logistics, um, getting cows carved early in the season at the front of the block can just rawly mean more days in milk across the year and therefore more milk production. Replacement heifers is often an interesting one. We probably all understand and grasp the fact that um, earlier born heifers, so older heifers, are much easier to get to target weights uh, ready for breeding. Um, and and more broadly, the higher the proportion of cows we're able to get in calf in that first four, maybe five weeks, which is the maximum I'd really want to be breeding cows for to dairy. Because I think if you start to get heifers that are six weeks younger at breeding two years later, 18 months later, 15 months later, um, it gets challenging to get them to those target weights. So generation of replacement heifers um, is, is a real benefit of good tight block carving, good fertility. Culling, ultimately, um, the end product of poor fertility is that we finish up with high empty rates and therefore culls. And future performance. Um, so one of the things that is often underestimated or underthought about when people talk about their fertility performance year on year is your fertility performance last year will have a profound effect on your fertility performance this year. And that's simply because cows need some time after they carve down. Classic all year round system, we talk about voluntary waiting period, a period of recovery time after calving to give those ch cows chance to get themselves sorted both nutritionally, metabolically, clean their uterus up, return to cyclicity so they're ready to breed. So I suppose my summary, and I just put a graphic up here, which is a classic grass growth curve for a, for a, uh, a herd in our sort of neck of the woods, uh, thinking about you know, the fact that the sooner we can get cows carved, the higher the proportion of the herd we have carved early, the easier it is to utilize that, that surge in spring grass growth. Um, but I suppose the real key message I'd give on block carving fertility when we talk about KPIs is that the focus needs to be on early carved cows, on front loading that block because that's what makes the system work. And just to expand on that last point because it cuts, um, cuts a little bit across uh, both the value of good fertility 
but also when you get into setting yourself targets it's nice to have aspirational targets and know where you're he heading for but um realistically if you've got a, a block at this moment in time that's very spread out you've got a real big tail of late calving cows and a, a suboptimal proportion of the herd calving in that first six weeks it will have an impact on what you can expect when you set your targets so setting reasonable targets so what you've got here is some data that was done in the southern hemisphere some years ago we've got as you go from work left to right we've got where the cows carved in the calving block this year so that left hand bar is your first three weeks of carvers 12 to nine weeks carved at point of breeding then the next three weeks of carvers and the third three weeks of carvers and then the cows that carve in the last three weeks before we plant the plants start mating and what that graphic is displaying is the subsequent six week in calf rate so what you should be able to see and it should make sense to all of us is the cows that have been carved ages when we start breeding are in good shape they've recovered in terms of uh, negative energy balance they've returned to cyclicity they've had loads of time to clean their uterus up and they breed well and the cows that have only just calved when we get to the planned start of mating um, struggle to get themselves back in calf in that first six weeks which is that classic key kpi we're going to talk about and the rule of thumb i always work to with herds to sort of put that in some sort of financial terms is that for every day later a cow goes in a calving block she's half a percent less likely to be back in calf by six weeks next time round um which if you then sort of think about the sort of figures that have been put out by chogas in ireland in the past that for every one percent improvement in six week in calf rate that's worth five pounds per cow in your herd um you can start to sort of put some value on the importance of that six week in calf rate if that makes sense to everybody so my key message would be it's all about that six week in calf rate and six week calf rate to drive subsequent fertility performance and make the system work so targets so you probably have all seen this before and this is ahdb strategic dairy farm targets I think this is the latest version but i'm sure somebody will correct me if i'm wrong but when we talk about fertility we're really talking about that top graphic there and and the figures you'll see banded about and i'll expand on these a little bit as we go through this target section the key target for a block calving herd would be to have 90 percent of your cows calved by six weeks before the planned start of mating and certainly the herds i deal with down here um would be there or thereabouts mostly um you know we we'd certainly be mid to high 80s up to 90 percent but that that is hard you have to absolutely execute all the numbers you have to execute every bit of the job well to achieve those sorts of targets now the slight challenge with six week in carved rate is that whilst it's tremendously accurate as sort of a, a target or a predictor of your business performance at the end of the day you guys get paid for calved cows that produce milk not in calf cows that might calf um it's really retrospective so when i'm working with herds the, the classic analogy i give is the accountant comes along three months after you close the financial year and tells you you made a hideous loss and the business is about to go bankrupt uh, whilst that is fundamentally very accurate in terms of reflecting the business's performance it's of absolutely no help to you in managing the business so we need to look at targets and kpis that sort of tell us something as we're going along um, and give us an, a, an ability to manage the business and react to things rather than just finding out a nasty shock at the end so again I would like to think that most of you who are on block carving systems will have seen these sorts of targets before. Um, what you've got here is the first column there is the target, classic industry target we would set for a, a good block carving herd. 
And then this is some data, a former colleague of mine who also deals with a lot of uh, block carving herd and me put together a few years ago. So you've got the, the, the sort of the figures from the top 25% of herds we deal with and then the average for those herds. So we've got down the bottom there, percentage of cows calved by six weeks. It's absolutely possible to achieve that, but it is hard. Like you have got to be really on it. There's no margin of error really to, to, to miss on that. Um, if we look through the rest of those targets, 21 day submission rate, you've got to get cows served to get them in calf. And I'd like to think most of you would be familiar with the target 90% of cows served by day 21. It's pretty important that that is at day 21. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about data analysis as we go through this. Some of you guys will be using computer programs, which classically for all year round herds, we tend to talk about 24 day submission rate targets um, because the natural cycle length for a cow is up to 24 days. There's not a problem if that's the number your computer program spits out in looking at that, but you would expect it to be higher by day 24. So it is important that if you're using the 90% target, you are looking at day 21. If you're going up to day 24, you would expect, and all of my herds would see, a dribble of two or three percent of cows that will come on between day 21 and 24. Um, because they just naturally have a longer uh, intercycle interval. Um, so if you're looking at 24 day submission rates, don't go kidding yourself that 90% of the day 24 is fine. It's not, it really should be 92, 93 by that point. Conception rate target, we'll generally be aiming for 60%. Um, and you'll see there's plenty of guys achieving that. Um, but that's probably the most common area of underperformance I see with the block calving herds I work with. So I think most of us have got the message that we need to get cows served and most of us are achieving those submission rate targets. But conception rate is more commonly the area we're struggling with. And I suppose that's where I'd, I'd highlight that point that assessing your performance at the end of the season is really critical to drive uh, your actions for next year because I've seen lots of people get to the end of the year think my well, six-week in calf rate's a bit disappointing we'll have to do more about submission rate next year um, well if you're at 90 percent 88 percent you know 91 percent submission rates there's really not going to be a huge amount of upside potentially in your heat detection and, and taking more steps there but if the six week in calf rate is lagging and that's because we're only achieving a 40 or 45 percent conception rate, then we really need to look at the things that drive that conception rate rather than waste time endlessly looking at heat detection. And then uh, six week in calf rates, I've already said, it'd be the real critical KPI that I think we should be looking at. It's, it's what drives the engine, which is what produces you efficient milk. Um, and I've got lots of herds hitting those sort of 80% marks, um, but there's still a lot of scope for a lot of herds out there to improve on that. And that is the thing that's going to deliver most value to your herds. End empty rates, I'm not saying I dismiss it or ignore it, but realistically, if we've done a good job, although Wallace and James do have an interesting story to tell here, which we'll get to in a few minutes, um, uh, if you've done a good job at six weeks, really it can only go so far wrong in the tail end of the block in those last four five six weeks that you're serving for so really i'd just be targeting less than 10 percent empty rates um the other thing that i just sort of mentioned when you think about assessing your empty rates is not only consider it in light of your six week in calf rate but consider it in light of the status of your herd if you're achieving good six week in calf rates um, the thing that I find most often starts to influence the end empty rate is the number of weeks you breed for. Obviously, the less weeks you breed for, the more empty cows you'll have at the end, but also the status of the herd. So you'll go to some newish setup herds 
where they've got a very high proportion of very young cows. Um, and you'll absolutely find people out there who are doing sub 5% empty rates after 10, 12 weeks. Um, but if you've got a slightly more established herd, you've got a higher proportion of older cows, um, you've got maybe some niggling problems in there like yonis or lameness, uh, things that are just drawing the cows back, and will tend to start to pull the end empty rate up a little bit. And that should walk us through to that sort of uh, six week in ca carved target. Now, the last thing I wanted to do before we get into the, um, the Millen's data is just sort of explain to everybody how those numbers add up and why it's so critical that we nail all these details if we're going to get there. Dave, can I interrupt you before you move on? Go on. Um, we've got a couple of comments and some questions. Um, do you use preg rate at all? Yeah, so that I imagine will have come from all year round herd. Um, it's <laughs> not a term we tend to use in block carving. What we tend to talk about is in calf rates. And although classically we do them in 21 day lumps, so 21 or 42 day in calf rates, what you're essentially talking about is the same thing which is the proportion of cows that get in calf in a three-week window that could get in calf in a three-week window. And I do, I use it a lot with my all-year-round herds because I think it's a good number to look at. Uh, it tells us about the efficiency of what we've done in that period. And it's actually something I'm going to come on to with Millens in a minute because it's, it's often the place I start when I look at block calving fertility because you can pick up some interesting patterns. You may see some problems in the early part of the block where we're AIing, and then some different problems later on in the block where we may be running bulls. Um, but I'll expand on that in a minute. Uh, another couple of questions here, Dave. There's a few people that are transitioning to blocks, and there's another one who's transitioning from an autumn to a spring. So that's something to bear in mind we're talking through. Also, should we be con no, are we concentrating on 12 or nine week blocks in this conversation? Yeah, so if I split those two questions apart, the guys who are in the transitional phase, I'll talk about that in just a second when I get to Millen's data, because I think what you have to be, like I've put the targets up there on that last slide. One of the things I think is very important is at the start of the season, so for Wallace and James in a few weeks' time, you set realistic targets with your team. Whilst we all know that if we're making that move to block carving, this is where we want to be, 90% of the herd calved at six weeks, six week in calf rates of 78, 80%. If, if you've got a really spread out block, if you've got a lot of late calf cows, you just won't achieve those targets this year. And it can be quite demoralizing, demotivating for people uh, in the team if you're setting targets and just setting them up for failure because they can't achieve them. So I'll talk it a little bit in a minute about, you know, sort of what I would set as reasonable targets if you're not in that settled block type scenario at this moment in time. Um, and then the second question, how long should you breed your cows for? Um, to be honest, guys, that entirely depends on you. Um, so if you are where you want to be, at six week in calf rate, 80%, and you're hitting the sort of preg rate, so 50 to 60% of your cows should be getting in calf every three weeks. Um, let's say you're at 80% in calf at six weeks. You should be at 90% in calf at nine weeks. Um, I see very different decisions made by my herds, and it really depends on um, where those people are up to in life and what their aspirations are. Um, I deal with a very successful lad, he's about my age, in his late 30s. Um, he started off um, about 10 years ago now. He took out a bank loan and bought, I think, 50 cows to go into a joint venture with his current business partner. And he now owns 50% of uh, 1,100 cows and another 25% of another 500 cows on another unit. Um, he has worked phenomenally hard to achieve that and he has really sweated his assets in that process. So he has always bred for 12 weeks. 
because he's really trying to minimise his end empty rates and, and keep keep growing his, his capital, if you like. I mm -hmm. equally deal with a lot of settled owner operator businesses where um, the lifestyle is important to them. Um, when their block is, is positioned, you know, avoiding school holidays and things like that so they can get time away with the kids giving themselves a bit of respite before they start the next, you know, hiatus of workload. So being categorically finished with carving before you start breeding uh, are all perfectly reasonable choices to make. I suppose I'd go back to if you focus on your six week in calf, right? If we start talking about, let's say, as an example, breeding for nine weeks instead of 12 weeks, it will have an impact. It will probably increase your end empty rate by four or five percent. Um, but that's a cost to doing business. Like if you're happy with that cost um, and you're happy to make that trade off for lifestyle, then it's a totally reasonable choice to make. I used to deal with a guy very close to where I'm sat at this moment in time who had a very clear idea of how much money he wanted to make each year. And if he was ahead of that on budget, he just had the relief milk room more and had more time off. Um, like he wasn't trying to make more money. He was trying to make his life easy. Um, and I think in farming, we sometimes lose track of the fact that the definition of success isn't necessarily how hard you work. It's that you're happy with what you do. Um, so the, the, the ideal length of a block is really a choice for you guys. I did one of these webinars a few weeks ago, which may still be available, Sophie, the Wade one where those lads are looking at maybe only breeding for six to eight weeks um, because they believe they can make the numbers work and the lifestyle is very important to them. You know, hats off to those guys if, if that's where they want to be and, and, and that works for their business and, and they're clear that they want more time at home with their family, then, then good luck to them. Um, got a bit deep there, Dave. <laughs> uh, okay, so if I, um, if I just press on because I, this is the last yeah. thing I want to do before we get to the milling stuff. So We've got a few more questions and six seem in but we can pitch them in yeah, okay. later on. Uh, so um, I've talked about 60% concept, uh, conception rates and I've talked about 90% submission rates and I think we'd all acknowledge that those are challenging like there's not a lot of upside if you're aiming for 90% 21 day submission rates. Like if I accept the fact that you will have some cows not cycling and some cows that will not have a heat within 21 days just because they've got a long intercycle interval um there's not a lot of scope to exceed that and i think we'd all accept that you know 60 percent conception rate on adult milking cows is you know it's challenging so i just wanted to flow you through a quick example of a 100 cow milking herd and how these numbers come together to sort of give us our targets and give us our end uh, KPIs. So we've got 100 cows. This guy is a settled block carver. He's not looking to expand. He's just looking to stand still. Got our key target. So we're going to serve 90 cows, 90% submission rate in the first 21 days. A 60% conception rate, that's going to give us 54 cows in calf in the first three weeks. It means we've got 46 going back to second round because they're not yet in calf, which again, if you hit a very similar submission rate, which is really what you need to achieve, is going to give us another 42 served in the second three weeks, which again, if we achieve that same sort of conception rate of 60%, is going to give us 25 in calf, give you 79 out of 100 in calf, in the first six weeks, which would be a 79% six-week in calf rate. So we're slightly ahead of target. I guess the question I sometimes get asked is, okay, so you've told me I need a 78% six-week in calf rate, but you've also told me I should be calving 90% of my cows by six weeks. How does that work? So we've obviously got some heifers to add into the mix. So he's a classic settled block, so he's probably rearing about 20% heifers. Um, so he's got 20 bulling heifers in the system. Target for heifers would be 90% of them. We'd expect more from our bulling heifers. 
So 90% of them should be in calf in that first six weeks. Which gives us 97 animals uh, in calf in the first six weeks to calf in the first six weeks. We're then going to lose our empties. So I sort of set a target of less than 10% uh, empty on the cows, and it should be less than 5% empty on the heifers, which means our 97 is out of 109 total animals in calf, which if anybody chooses to do the maths on that, it's going to be 89% six-week calved rate. So I suppose my point at this stage would be, we've said that 90% submission rate, you know, it's, it's hard work, you know, we've said that 60% conception rate, it's not easy to exceed. Um, and it, and that only gets you, that only gets you to the target. So it's not going to work if you sort of think, all right, well, I think I might get 91% of them served this year. And you try to compensate the fact that you've only got a 40% conception rate. You absolutely have to nail both of these numbers if you're going to make the system work. The last point that sometimes comes up with people, um, and I think it's useful to get your head around when you're planning. Um, I've said I've got 100 cow milk in herd and I'm stable, but I've got 109 cows in calf. So why is that? And it's simply because we're going to expect some losses. So you're going to get some abortions between PD and uh, calving. And the number I always work to is about half a percent per month that passes after PD. So assuming you're PD in a couple of months in calf on average, something like that, you're going to have seven months of gestation. You can expect to lose about three and a half percent of pregnancies. So generally speaking, I budget with people that we're going to lose three to five percent of our pregnancies to abortions across the season. And you're also going to have some early lactational losses. So they go for different reasons, but they do go you know, the old cow that goes down with milk fever and never gets up again, the difficult calving, the cow that slips over in the yard and breaks a leg, the yoni's cow that calves down and falls to bits. They go for different reasons. But if you look at the data across lots and lots of herds, you tend to find that the, the proportion is, is sort of scarily predictable and it tends to be about three to five percent. So when you're doing your you know, calculations and stuff. I would always be budgeting to have eight to ten percent more cows in calf when you've PD than you actually want in milk at peak next year round. Does that make sense? Okay, so we're going to come on to Millens now. Um, yeah. just... Sorry, another couple of questions before we go into Millens. Um, what are the key drivers of a conception rate? Um, so, uh, why are you going to get a, um, a low conception rate? So, we're going to look up some factors as we go through to uh, James and Wallace's figures. Um, uh, but classic uh, semen, so either the bull or the technician putting the semen in. So, factors around the service of the cows. Um, timing of AI. So that comes back to accuracy of heat detection. There's some particular patterns we might look at that might indicate that that is, um, that is an issue. Um, um, uh, nutrition. So either frank malnutrition, negative energy balance in early lactation, which might be to do with your milking cow diet, but might also to be to do with your transitional health. So if you've correctly prep those cows to be able to bridge that negative energy gap coming out of the dry period. You've also within nutrition got factors like minerals. Um, don't ignore minerals, but there's always a man in a white van wants to sell you a solution to your problem. Um, mineral deficiencies are relatively uncommon in most herds, as long as you've got sensible processes in place. Um, but, you know, we do need to have a plan around that, I suppose. Um, you've then got the other half of the uterine, uh, uh, the transitional health side of things, which would be about sort of calcium, milk fever, uterine health type stuff. Um, so if we've got a lot of dirty cows, because that will damage the developing follicles, 
damage the uterine environment and therefore leave it more difficult for that cow to conceive. Um, and uh, what have I talked about? I've talked about service timing, I've talked about serving, I've talked about nutrition, I've talked about transitional health, um, and um, uh, uh, infectious disease is probably the other one. Uh, and there's different patterns, and I'm going to show you that in a couple of seconds that we can look at in terms of breaking our conception rate apart that might give us some indications if our overall conception rate is low. So let's say you were targeting 60%, you've achieved a 45% conception rate. How we can go from saying our conception rate's a bit low to I believe that conception rate problem is coming from a nutritional issue, a transitional health issue, uh, an AI technician issue, um, an infectious disease issue, if that makes sense to everybody. Thank Any you, more yeah, loads, I'm afraid. <laughs> so I'll just pause sure. you there. Um, so this is a question on this sub, uh, what is the submission rate next? I think it's how it's calculated to give that end one. Um, is it planned pre-serving cull decisions or is it as a percentage of the yeah, whole? Yeah, the only cows you should be excluding from the denominator, so the bottom portion of the division calculation, uh, is anything you genuinely have no intention of serving. So I'm aware that there are herds out there who, you know, proactively decide that that cow's bag is dragging along the floor and, you know, I don't really want to serve that again. Um, I tell you that's an alien concept in Cheshire, Shropshire and Staffordshire. Uh, broadly, you know, if, it, if it's still walking around the place, we'll try and serve it because most of my herds are actively trying to expand. Um, but, uh, but I am aware of the mythical herd out there that makes voluntary culling decisions and, and genuinely chooses not to breed cows. So um, I suppose in my neck of the woods, we have got uh, some producers because of their contracts and stuff like that would actively be choosing not to reserve the only cows. And that's obviously a positive thing. But if you've got, let's say, 300 cows at the plant start of mating in your herd, and let's say there are five cows that you genuinely said, I am not going to serve that again, then you would divide the number served at day 21 by 295 for 300 minus the five. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a few questions on conventional semen versus sex semen and bulls, but we're going to cover that later, yeah? Yeah. And uh, just a comment here, sure, nutrition is first and foremost the biggest variable in fertility. Um, that's just a comment, no need to elaborate. Just I'm, I'm you know. going to kind of agree <laughs> with whoever made that, but echo the fact that if you look through block carving figures, the number one factor that affects your performance this year is your performance last year. Um, after that, whoever made that comment is perfectly correct that uh, well-fed cows get back in calf. If you look after them, farming is a simple game. It's probably three variables done exceedingly well every day. So keep them clean, keep them well fed. Don't stress them. Um, you do those things well and, and the job's easy. Um, anything else, Sophie? Yes, I'm sorry, Dave. So I've got another question here on what do you think about the Why Wait programme? So in terms of first services. Yeah, yeah, I know what you're asking me. So the, just for everybody else, the Why Wait programme is the idea that um, you've got a group of cows that at the most simple level will come bulling in the third week. Um, so just because of statistically where their um, cycle falls, they will bull in week three, week six, week nine, week 12. And the idea is that um, why wait to serve those cows when you can put in place a very simple intervention crossed them around the plan start of uh just just after the plan start of mating and you can bring their cycle forward a week essentially for the sake of a couple of quid um i think it can be a very effective tool when you're trying to tighten blocks up um and i'm not against it at all i don't currently have any customers use it because um, most of my blocks are in reasonable shape at this moment in time. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. If you're trying, if you're one of those herds transitioning and you're just trying to drag services forward and get cows served as soon as you can, it can be a useful tool in helping you to achieve that. But it's probably a bit more than I can cover today. 
No, thank you, Dave. And there was another question earlier on about meeting heifers. Should they be done two weeks prior to the cows, maybe involving a sink as well? So that's maybe something we can talk about later. Dave. Yeah, so um, again, with, well, I know everybody's going to have lots of questions and I could I could li literally spend about nine hours on this webinar and, and not, no. not everything. <laughs> But um, in summary to that question, yes, heifers take a couple of weeks on average longer to turn themselves round after first calf and get back in calf. So there's a couple of strategies you can play with there. You can either breed them earlier than the cows, which is something you can do with bullying heifers because you've not obviously got the complexity of when they calf. Um, you can uh, synchronize them. So on average, Av you know they start on day one rather than you know on average starting on day 10 by the time they're equally spread over 21 days or you can do a combination of the two but it is well worthwhile putting some effort into breeding your heifers earlier to um to to help with that process so to speak okay thank you dave and just um, more of a comment here. Um, are we sure that last six weeks of breeding only settled 2% of cows? I think that was relative to your last slide. Say that again, last 2% of... Are we sure that the last six weeks of breeding only settled 2% of cows? Only settled 2% of cows. The last six weeks of breeding 12% of cows. I'm not saying that people won't exceed that because some people will, but if you're 78 percent in calf at six weeks and 90 percent at 12 weeks you'd be knocking down another 12 in that last six weeks and logically why that works guys is because as you get into the tail if you've done a good job at six weeks uh you'll progressively get into the detritus in the end of the block the type of cows that you could keep banging away at from now until next christmas and they're still not getting calf the old girls, the lame girls, the thin girls, um, and they just become a, a higher and higher proportion of the remaining group. So back to whoever asked about preg rate earlier, uh, we'll see in a second, but I would expect the preg rate to just dip away a little bit in the tail because you are getting into a high proportion of problem cows at that stage. Thank you, Dave. And a final one, and then we will crack on. Don't you allow for a percentage of deaths? So do you allow for a percentage of deaths in your rate? Uh, I'm going to assume somebody's asking about uh, sort of from the point of that we start uh, breeding through to, you know, either when we PD them or, or the end of the year or something like that. Um, kind of do and I kind of don't. Um, there, is an, um, there is a slight thing that I should probably say that, there's two different ways you can calculate your ring calf rate um, and you'll see it different by different people. Some advisors will tell you to divide the number of cows that you've got in calf by cows at peak milk and some people will tell you to do it by uh, the, the cows you actually PD'd. Um, normally there should be relatively little difference between those two numbers. I'd like to think that for most of us, we might lose an odd cow between, um, let's say, the start of May when we start breeding and the start of September when we when we PD the cows. Um, but there are obviously some factors that might come into that and influence it. So in my area, uh, unlike for you guys, it's TB. Like it would not be uncommon for Wallace was just uh, bemoaning his feet this morning this morning before we started this because he's been on his feet TB testing and he has to do it once a year at the moment. The vast majority of my herds have to do it every 60 days um, and it's not uncommon for them to lose 10 or 15 <laughs> hours between starting breeding and PD. Um, the reason to do it by cows at peak milk is it kind of gives you an indication of overall business efficiency. It's the proportion of cows you are retaining but that is obviously influenced by other factors beyond pure fertility. TB is an example. Uh, I tend personally to look at it by across cows that are PD'd. So when I do my submission rate calculation, I would divide it by the proportion of cows we were going to serve. When I did my in calf, I would do it by the proportion of the, the number of cows we actually PD'd. 
uh, and it might be between those two numbers we have lost 10 cows but i will take account of that in the calculation if you like but it is why you will see people calculate it in slightly different ways i tend to do it by cows pd because i'm more focused on what's our absolute fertility rather than our overarching business efficiency if that makes sense yeah that does thank you very much dave and one last comment the two percent of cows breeding in the last six weeks is actually late into millens what we've got up on the screen just now so if you go down uh, to 16 calf 59 final in calf yeah. 16 but i'll let you get to that yeah so we'll um, talk about we'll that now. Wallace and james they've been sitting there yeah. very patiently <laughs> okay guys so if we launch into millens so what we've got here is those classic kpis and i'm now going to start to walk you through how i would approach this if i was in your shoes my fertility wasn't quite as good as i wanted it to be and i was starting to think about what i'm going to do differently for next year so first things first we all, i already referenced this so for the millens herd they're about 10 14 percent lower on that six week carved rate than we would ideally like them to be and that is going to have an impact moving forward and on the, the sort of the subsequent targets I would set for them. So um, we sort of said that we'd be targeting a six week in calf rate of 78%. Um, the guys I have hitting sort of 85% calf rates will, will achieve that six week in calf rate. But if you're sort of more mid 70s, six week calf rate, it is gonna drag your six week in calf rate down and it's probably going to drag it down to the tune of sort of three, maybe four percent. Um, so um, setting realistic targets, you start to start to think about that as I'm judging the data here. So looking at the ratio of cows calved at six weeks at Millen, 76 percent, I would have been expecting James and Wallace not necessarily to smash 78 out of the park, but I'd have certainly been liking to see them achieving low to mid 70s, if that makes sense to everybody. Then got the submission rate and the conception rates, and we'll expand on this a little bit. So we can already see that we've got some issues in both of those numbers there. So we talked about the importance of hitting 90 and 60, and we're, we're low in both those areas. And that's what's driving that six week in calf rate. But you'll also sort of see that um, six week in calf rate is perhaps a little bit better. I'm not going to I'm not going to do the maths because it'll take too long and um, you'll all get bored. But it's perhaps slightly better than we might expect it to if we were languishing at truly 35 percent conception rates with 70 percent submission rates. That would only get us to sort of. 24% uh, in calf at, at three weeks and, and sort of 40, 45% in calf at six weeks. So there's something else going on there. And then the question somebody has asked this final empty rate, there's a bit of a discrepancy here, isn't there, Wallace? Are you there, Wallace? Yes. So, um, a little bit well, but, uh, so the, yeah, so the final in calf rate at Mullins on the scanning results was about sort of 20. Four or twenty-three percent empty balance. Uh, Netherlands got worse. It was around seventeen percent this year, and the year before it was fourteen percent. So that's why we were on the cows that we were milking, and what, you know that was a percentage on that. There's an element of the roll round cows in this, so they're not going to see any semen. Obviously, they're just getting run with bulls in the autumn block. If we're pulling, they're pulled into this data as well because it's just at the time you ever looked at it. Um, uh, and, th and then my dad buys cows, which is, a, a, a we'll have this conversation, the discussion group quite a lot, and John Beard thinks I should shoot him um, to stop the problem. Um, um, no. well, but we can't do that. Um, no. so, and he's, so we are aware of that. Um, and, then, and, um, and I think because we've not been looking at, the, you know, the 21 rate, the conception rate in the past, uh, the data, uh, just keeping that data, making sure that, you know, the pre-mating data is going on, everything's actually going in there. Um, 
uh, correctly at, at the start. So there is an issue with data capture in these things. Yeah, so we'll come we'll come back to this as we go through, guys. But um, one of the actions for <clears throat> Wallace is that data is a phenomenally valuable tool. If you don't, you can't manage it. I, and it's what, like, I don't know how you get to the end of the season and without the data, be able to understand what you should do differently next year. Um, I know we went through this analysis with James and Wallace a few weeks ago. There are some discrepancies in their gut feeling about where their numbers are and what the database they're running, uh, they're using for the data analysis is. Um, and I suppose the, the summary point that I sort of made is that the data is only as good as the data we put in. Um, I know that some of these programs aren't the easiest to use, uh, but there is a phenomenal amount of value out of that data. So, you know, taking steps to make sure it's as good as it can be is important. The summary of the person who asked the 2% question is, um, it's probably better than this reflects. This is what the database is showing for James and Wallace at the moment. Uh, but um, it's still pretty light in the tail end, given where they were at six weeks. Um, and we'll expand a little bit on the reasons for that in a couple of minutes. So you've all got a sort of an overview of where their numbers are. So how are we going to break that apart? and start to understand what's driving those things. So somebody asked it earlier. So this is pregnancy rate. So I've sort of walked through those numbers, 90% submission rate, 60% in calf rate, generates you 54% of your cows in calf in a three week period. Um, so what you've got here is the target, my expectation, how many cows of the available cows I would expect to get in calf in each three week block across the breeding period. And then in orange, what Millen's actually achieved. And this can be really useful to look at because it can show you some interesting things. So some of the patterns I'll sometimes see, uh, we do really well in the first cycle. We then got a hole in the second cycle and then we improve in the third and fourth cycle. That's a classic pattern for a block carver who goes out with a load of piss and vinegar on day one, gets all the cows served, then goes a little bit off the boil in the second three weeks, he's getting a bit tired, isn't just putting quite the effort into the heat detection and his submission rate dwindles. He then throws the bulls out and they catch up. Equally, we'll sometimes see um, it's a bit low in the first three weeks, and then it gets better in the second three weeks and better in the third three weeks. That's a good indication of a transitional health issue. So as the cows get further into lactation, they're in better shape, better body condition, and are therefore getting in calf better. Uh, so we see that rising trend. So there's some different patterns you can pick up here. So what have we got here? Well, it's low all the way through. That third and fourth cycle when the bulls were running at Millens is probably a bit artificially low, but it's definitely still low during that period. It's getting worse. So it starts off low and gets worse as we go into second uh, cycle. Uh, just to expand very briefly before I move on, because it might be a question, you'll see that I've set those targets at sort of mid 50s, mid 50s, and then 50 and 45. That's because as in a classic block carved system, I would expect uh, if we do a good job in the first and second cycle, we'll get into a higher proportion of those sort of uh, broken cows, those problem cows quicker. And that's going to mean that they will become a larger proportion of the available cows and that will start to diminish your uh, pregnancy rates as you get into the third and fourth cycle. So summary for Millens. We've got we've, we've definitely got problems going on all the way through here. It's not just that heat detection went wobbling the second three weeks or the cows weren't ready to conceive in the first three weeks. There are some challenges right across the breeding season. So if we start off and we start to look at those key KPIs, so I'm going to start off with submission rate. So what you've got here 
is the proportion of cows served. So it's not services, it's cows being served as we go through the AI period. So there's a couple of sort of slightly funny things here. Um, I've said that we'd expect 90% of our cows to be served by the end of three weeks. So as you can see there, we're not there. We're, we're just over 70%, so there's a hole there. Now, we might expect some, some hole there because James and Wallace did have some very late calved cows, some cows still calving after the plants start mating, which will pull these figures down. But they probably are a bit light. The other thing that, that is a little bit curious when I look at these numbers is the fact that we've got quite a high proportion of cows served in the first week. And I'm going to expand on that in a second. The third thing I would just sort of draw everybody's attention to is that we really slow up in weeks four, five and six. And given that we've still got quite a lot of open cows that haven't been served, um, it's an interesting thing to look at sometimes. You're always going to have some cows that haven't been served by day 21. What happens to those cows? So if we've got a robust breeding strategy in place, we're doing things like synchronization because we will have to do that on some cows. We should be mopping those cows up and bringing this process to an end. Everything should have had semen in by week four, week four and a half. Whereas we've still got a high proportion of cows just drifting off back into the block here. Um, so we've got a couple of, of issues there potentially. And if we then look at heat detection, so one of the ways we might uh, sort of assess the accuracy of our heat detection is to look at uh, the number of days between one service and the next service. So what you would generally expect, so um, cows should return at 18 to 24 days. The six week return would be at sort of 35 to 48 days. Um, and then we might see cows getting served at a short interval, so two to 17 days or at sort of a weird long interval, sort of uh, 25 to 35 days. Um, and generally what we should expect to see is a really big peak here, normal returns, a really small peak here. So we should expect five, six times as many cows to be being served here, as are being served here on their return. And then we'd always expect some mistakes, some cows that we serve either because they have a weird heat or just if you're going to be accurate and you're going to pick up all your heats, you're going to make some mistakes. But we generally only be expecting to see sort of 10, 15 percent of cows being served at those abnormal uh, inter-service intervals. Now, I know when we talked about this, James and Wallace said, which is a legitimate point and you'll hear sort of thrown around, semen's cheap. I'd much rather we got cows AI'd and we made some mistakes, we served some cows when they weren't fully on heat, um, than we missed those cows and they didn't get served at all. And that's a perfectly reasonable point, but it's important that we've got a robust system in place that identifies when that cow comes into more heat. So one of the mistakes I've seen people make over the years is that they see a cow she's a little bit rubbed a little bit messed about and they think well that might be on heat i'll put straw in it today now there then becomes a question if you're using tail head mounted heat detection when do you paint that cow back up or when do you put a scratch car back on some people will put repaint them straight away the problem with that is if that cow comes into more heat over the next 12 hours so you've served her just slightly too early well, this afternoon when she comes back in for milking and she's rubbed up again, well, you sort of say, oh, well, she was on bullying this morning. That's why she's rubbed up. Um, so we ignore that when, in fact, that's probably the ideal window for her to be served. And then when she's rubbed up the following day, because she was still on heat that afternoon and going off heat going into the following morning, we then think, well, that cow's rubbed up again. Maybe I served her too early. So we serve her again. And what we've managed to do is serve her both too early and too late and miss the optimal window, which might reduce our conception rate. So I've got no problem with you making mistakes. You know, you've got to go into this with that expectation. 
but you just need to have a decent robust strategy in place that means that if that cow comes into more heat we do definitely get served at the optimal time we don't sort of miss it either side and just coming out of that data there is just some question marks there about whether we're getting all of these cows served at the optimal time the other thing to say is if you're double serving a lot of cows it will of course dilute and artificially reduce your apparent conception rate um, because your conception rate is a calculation of cows in calf divided by services um, so it's just something to be aware of and if we look at the conception rate half of things so there's a few different ways i tend to look at this i always start off by looking at conception rate by age because i think as an industry we've still got a lot of scope and, and improvements to make on young stock rearing so what you've got here across the bottom is conception rate by lactation number and to be fair to the guys although the conception rate is not where you would like it to be possibly slightly artificially reduced by the number of double services um, the first conception the first lactation animals the carved heifers are doing better than the rest of the cows it's hard work for heifers like they're still growing they're adjusting to the herd so i'd never expect them to be smashing it out of the park but they should at least be achieving what the second and third lactation cows are and, and they're doing that here so there's no evidence that this is a, a bullying young stock rearing type issue another way to look at your conception rate is to look at it by days in milk so what you can see here again don't worry too much about the absolute numbers but just look at the patterns is we're getting that upward trend now you'd always expect cows you're serving within 42 days of calving to have a reduced conception rate but realistically by the time they're six weeks calved they should be fit to serve and get calf and you can see there we've got a substantial increase between cows being served at 40 to 80 days calf and then 80 to 120 days calf so one of my points here and 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 james wallace will probably just mention some of the changes they're making is that there does seem to be some evidence here of some transitional health issues whether that's coming from milk fever and uterine health whether that's coming from body condition and sort of ketosis i can't say from this but there's definitely some work there to do around transitional health as we move these cows from the dry period to lactation the other sort of um uh interesting trend that came out of this data is conception rate by month um and it's always worth looking at because sometimes you do see some changes across the year now back to some of the discussions we've had about um data and things like that we can't currently explain this trend but it does seem here that um cows got in calf substantially better in may than they did in june which is why we were still AI. Now, whether that's a change in grass quality or environmental conditions or, or nutrition is something we'll need to look at this year. But I think it's not uncommon when you look at these trends that you sometimes find these things that you really can't explain. And I think the key, if you get to one of those situations, is that you, you at least put yourself in the position for the following year, where if that trend repeats itself, that you've got enough data that you can explain it um so there is something weird going on there by month of service but, but we're not currently sure what exactly is going on there last point on the analysis um because i'm conscious of time that i just want to touch on is the heifer performance so again what you've got here in blue is the the, the targets we expect and um and in the orange we've got what we achieved now there's a little story that i've sort of alluded to a couple of times the tail performance wasn't the best um wallace do you want to talk about the bulls briefly silence i'll talk about the bulls then um, no i keep putting them on mute sorry dave i forget you can't see him wallace are you there can you speak now can't hear him until he gets on i'll i'll explain so <laughs> thank you um, Dave. 
Wallace and James uh, served these heifers to AI um, with with a, a synchronization program, I believe. Um, and then and their conception rate to that AI was, was pretty good. Um, they used the same batch of bulls to breed both groups of stock. Um, so some of these bulls were first used with the heifers and then went out with the cows. And one of the factors you've got in the mix here, and this is why it's important to look at this data broken apart, because otherwise it might lead you in, in um, misleading directions, because there's different things going on here, is this batch of bulls has not rewarded Wallace. Um, I gave Wallace a little bit of stick when we spoke a few weeks ago, because we met once before many years ago at uh, uh, AHDB fertility meeting up in Scotland. And one of the things I'm absolutely categoric, I told him on that day, was uh, that if you're relying on bulls, fertility test the bulls, there is a high proportion of bulls are subfertile or infertile, and every study on every continent replicates that. About 10% of bulls are infertile, and about 20% of bulls are subfertile. And the worst problem is this, your dominant bull is infertile or subfertile, who will stop other bulls from serving. So just flooding the job with bulls doesn't necessarily get you to where you should be. Like, it's important. You've got a lot of eggs in the basket of a few bulls, potentially. Um, Wallace decided, because I recognise that it's difficult times for you dairy farmers, and that saving that, that, that few pounds on fertility testing the bulls is, is critical to whether you make a profit or not this year, not to fertility test these bulls. And unfortunately, mm. <laughs> I can fix it on the arse. Um, so I would only say what I would say to anybody is if you're relying on bulls to get animals in calf, make sure they are functional and fertile and prepped for the breeding season. Dave, you will be glad Wallace was on mute there, but if you, Wallace, just try and click it one more time and it should come off. He's doing no yeah, I heard. I saw the lip movement. Um, Dave, while we're waiting on Wallace and James coming back, um, well, just, just I've got a question. we can ask any questions. So, just to summarise that all that for you guys. So, I've been through the data there, and you've seen it. And, and, and my summary and my sort of feedback to the guys is is here. So, we have got some challenges there on submission rate. I think there's some scope there potentially to revisit the heat detection plans and I know the guys have put in place some technology to help with that, both potentially to improve the accuracy, which might help us with our conception rate a bit, uh, but also to capture more cows and get more cows served. And I also think there's, there's a bit of an action there about the intervention strategy and the overall breeding strategy that just makes sure we don't have a proportion of cows just drift off into lactation without ever getting semen in them. There are some issues with conception right there, um, and we've had a bit of a chat about some changes around transition management, uh, but there's certainly some evidence that, that might be an issue. And as I've said, it may be that that conception rate is getting potentially both artificially reduced, but potentially really reduced if that heat detection is just not quite as it could be. And, and then there's that open question about the, the dip in conception rate later in the grazing season as to whether that could be to do with grass factors, nutrition factors, maybe mineral factors as we go through the grazing season that we, we're doing some sampling to try and understand. Bull fertility, we've got to get them tested if we're going to use them. And then as one or two people have asked questions about the data there, um, there are some areas we're just not 100% on, and, and I know Wallace and James have found some challenges there with the data capture that they might talk about, um, and just the need for us just to just to refine that next year so the data is better and that makes us better able to make better decisions this time next year. Thank you, Dave. Wallace, speak now. It says that your mic's on. He's not wanting to speak, or you're not going to speak, or is it not working? It's not me. I promise it's not me. It's <laughs> saying it's not. <laughs> hey, I don't know what has happened. I've asked our techie girl to try and help as well, but nothing's showing up on their speech. Very unfortunate. Just write it down on a piece of paper, Wallace, and just put it oh, in the screen. We're unmuted. Hey, oh, he's he's here, here, he's here, he's here. I didn't touch a thing. 
Finally, HDB's got it organised. Good. Um, <laughs> firstly, it was a, firstly, it was the price of a bull to test all the bulls, so it wasn't an insignificant figure. Anyway, so that's what put me off. Um, so we've been doing it once. A year. <laughs> so we had we've been doing it once a year up to that point, and then I think we probably need to do it twice a year again. Um, I mean, we, we pulled out um, before the autumn, I think, uh, three bulls that were only working. And they probably, again, with the heifer performance, there was one older bull which was probably knocking off. The, the, that's the trouble. You don't, when you don't test them, you've got the bull that could be knocking off the other two younger bulls and the bull that kills. So. But, I mean, the bull management was pretty good in terms of switching the bulls around about. We had a good team of, well, we didn't have a good team of bulls. We were managing those bulls well enough. So, Again, we just need to get back to taste some bulls, and we've done that with the autumn herd, so we'll see what comes there. Um, further to that, I suppose we'll get into this discussion later on, probably as to whether we've, we've bought some uh, collar um, technology for uh, the, the main spring herd and the heifers, just because they're using sex semen in the heifers. So, um, my idea of that being is to run the eye for 12 weeks. Um, um, uh, so that we don't need to run just so many bulls. Uh, also, we have two spring herds and one autumn herd. You're carrying twice the number of bulls you really need to for the autumn. Um, uh, and it's a significant cost, the bulls, to keep them correct and in the herd. So hopefully if we can do that um, using technology um, uh, to take the workload out of it, certainly in the, in the, in the last two, in the last of two sessions of service, um, we'll try it. Yeah, I mean, if, if I can just dip in and pick up on something Wallace said there, like there's lots of reasons to use bulls, both for livestock breeds and, and because exhaustion with heat detection is a real factor um, that you need to think about. But if you actually start working out how much those pregnancies in the tail end from the bulls cost you by the time loaded up with a pile of bulls and you've had to keep them all year and feed them and then they only have to last a couple of years and you know the the capital depreciation and all these things it gets to quite a scary number so there is some capacity there for you to invest in technology if that's the way you choose to go and i've certainly got particularly on autumn systems because we just rinse through bulls <clears throat> With the bull calf issue, I've got an increasing number of clients looking at some capital outlay, some technology, and potentially moving away from bull use. So there's a couple of comments and questions come through here. Um, how many bulls do you use, Wallace, to 100 cows? Well, we had uh, 24 bulls in circulation for sort of 600 cows, so um, it's roughly about... Is um, that 25. One of twenty-five. Uh, but obviously there would there be there would be three, four bulls among the heifers. So slightly more than that, one to four. Okay. And also any use of teaser bulls, Dave, Wallace James? Uh, no, but we have them Something in the up. system this year to do about eight of them in the system for next year. I think I think again you you probably find some stuff I've done in online. Teasers can be a valuable tool. Like there's two reasons. One, uh, they obviously help you identify bull and cows. Bulls will sniff out cows that are silent, you won't be able to see. But there is some genuine data that the presence of a male has an impact on the cyclicity of the cows. Exactly what the sheep have done for years. It can stimulate cows to come bulling to return to by putting a male in there. Now, that's a challenge because you want to generate replacements out of your first few weeks in front of the block, but a teaser can still have that impact and have a benefit and not interfere with the AI process. Um, I've also had a question about electronic heat detection. I know that's something you're looking into. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, well, we've been pricing systems around about. I think we're getting near or getting settled in one now. Like, but that is the plan going forward is to work with a heat time system, and hopefully that'll be a, 
a decent aid to our heat detection. And I would echo that in my patch, like, I have a lot of Isla producers and, you know, they're grasping the nettle on the truth of, truth of the bull calf issue. Um, and they don't believe that they can breed for 12 weeks and maintain the intensity of heat detection they would need to, to not finish up with so most of those guys have been looking or have fitted some sort of a, a you know automated heat detection system and there's lots of data from all these ground systems that they they can be very effective um so yeah I think there's some value there if that's a business decision you're looking at yeah guys government have helped us along yeah. so it's it's never helped yeah james wallace there's someone making a cup of tea or doing something and it's just about all we can hear. So can I, can I just ask? Um, I've, got two points. I've not forgotten one of the questions. So um, the other the other point about sort of electronic ID systems, and it, it will be an issue for us as an industry as we move forward, probably. Uh, there's a strategic dairy farm down in Oxford, a guy called Phil Kinch, and I, I thought he put a very interesting point across about two years ago when I was down there doing some work that one of the reasons he fitted an, uh, an electronic heat detection system was the fact that he had a very good herdsman at the time who was exceptionally good at heat detection. But he was worried that if he lost Ben, um, it would have quite a profound impact on his business because he didn't think it would be easy to replace Ben. So by fitting that electronic system, it, it, it gave some, some, you know, some protection to his business. Uh, which is interesting because Ben has subsequently moved on to the unit I know what in my neck of the woods. Um, so there are different reasons to look at that strategy. The, the, I was going to put to Wallace and Jones because we had a conversation about this the other day was um, dry cow management. Um, we had a discussion about how you, what you're feeding your dry cows and what you're going to do differently this year. Do you want to say anything about that? Well, in terms of, see, I've noticed a big difference with problems in, in the autumn block this year. Uh, last year. Sorry, last year, last autumn. And uh, it was with an awful lot of uh, milk fevers and it just seemed to keep growing and I just basically just changed the transition diet at the time. I went and started feeding a lot of mag flakes and put them onto a TR ration. Whereas before I was just feeding silage and a dry cow roll and it just didn't seem to be working. And the minute I changed over, it was it was just like a switch, like just everything, the milk fevers all stopped and the difference, the cows were calving out a lot cleaner, a lot less whites. So that was an area where I think is a problem and it's something we need to work on to, to have a look at because it, it, I think it is a crucial area. I Meaning before, this is what we've been doing at Mullins before, was just the dry cow cob. And and Silas like and that, I think that's something that we need to look at to try and th th there is an area there for improvement. So the, 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 yeah, and so so just in the back of the chat again, we talked about crap pay, so it's probably yeah. just trying to get that uh, kind of more rubbishy uh, uh, hay or just a different type of fibre coming into the ration further out in the dry cow mm -hmm. ration, just to get them to eat more good silage when they do come home for calving. Uh, so in the back of James's chat, and it'll be we're, we're going to have a conversation with the guys next week after today. Um, but it was really around uh, using that system when the cows are calving inside, and then we'll probably look at the rolls again once they start calving outside. But we, you're talking into probably end of March, beginning of April, before we're thinking about that. It just gets too wet for us up here. Can I just? Oh, go on, Sophie. Uh, I'm just very conscious it's 12.59 and we've got quite a few more questions. <coughs> Can I just add one in there? Like, I don't think we're going to answer all the questions today, but I'll try and get back to people individually if we don't get your questions <coughs> answered. The reason that we are in Ayrshire here, this is a question that has been sent in. So have you used sex semen on your heifers? Are the previous year's figures any better? And do you think the spring drought has had any impact at the crucial time of mating? I'm smiling because I don't think we get a drought in Ayrshire. 
We love a drought in Ayrshire. Yeah, drought's, drought's good. <laughs> it's falling down your way, Dave. But yeah, so yeah. have you got thick semen on your heifers and has that had an impact on the... No, the, the heifers actually, the AI on the heifers, we use sex semen on a sort of bog standard, so sort of a, a natural heats for seven days and then jagging the prostaglandin and we'd 60% in calf with that, which, um, I mean, um, with another friend of ours in the discussion group, he, he did a similar program, a full cedar program, they get the exact same conception rate on his heifer, so that part, it wasn't too bad. Um, we used stickers for the first time, which we were needing to get a wee bit better and just, well, we, we need to buy the right stickers and make sure they don't yeah, fall off. And system, that's so, uh, but again, we're putting the heat time system on that just to improve, improve the accuracy of putting that set semen in there. So that really for us is going to be the key around that that, um, uh, that synchro that we use that, that we're getting properly identifying heats during those six, seven days um, before we do the prostaglandin. So. Um, that's the second reason why we're using that. But we were quite happy with those six semen results when we compared them to, to as our, as our friend. If I can chip my oar in, I've got quite a lot of units using sex semen on the heifers um, and getting perfectly good results in line with what you'd expect, which is about a 10% reduction on conception, conventional semen. So if you were going to do 65%, you'd do 59% or whatever. Um, most of my guys sink their heifers mainly just practically because they the heifers are away and it's too difficult to do them any other way and um and get perfectly good results uh doing that program um and uh, i think the bigger thing you need to concentrate on sex is how you do the process sex semen has already been messed about with it's a fragile product you just will not get away with handling it in the way you might with, with conventional. So I think there's a lot for people to think about there in terms of how they eye, they eye their cows, their heifers, if they're using sex, rather than worry much about the sex versus the conventional. Okay. I've had another couple of questions on the bulls. Um, Wallace, James, do you sell or just loan your bulls out? And if it is unsuccessful, then what happens? Um, we do, uh, well, we do both. We sell and look. Um, obviously, we're not using them. Yep. Okay. Um, um, but, so, uh, the testing effect's going to help with that as well. But there's a slight risk of compiler back to we're doing that. We've not had an issue with it. But, um, it's, uh, yeah. it's always a risk. It's always a risk. And what success have you seen estimating not served cows on day 11 of the serving season? So Dave, see again. Not sure who that one's for. Dave, what success have you seen estimating not serving cows yeah, on day 11? I, I'm going to guess what that question is about. So I do a lot of work with my clients on lead indicators. So things you measure today that aren't necessarily going to equate to your end performance. <clears> you're on track so one of the things we would look at is daily targets so yeah, again sure, sure. find some of my previous presentations on the hdb website but um a lot of my guys will have a whiteboard up they'll know how many cows they've got to serve 90 percent of them equates to whatever that is 210 cows to serve in 21 days divided by 21 days is 10 a day and they will be filling in next to that on the next column across the number they're actually serving and on a daily basis reviewing their projected submission rate um that you know at week at day seven day 10 day 14 we're we're asking those questions early if we're lagging behind or if we're seeing a lot of repeat services um a lot of repeat services might indicate <coughs> uh lagging behind target might indicate a lack of sensitivity that you're missing services or there's a problem with the cow. Thank you Dave. Wallace, James, another two questions on the bulls just so we can tidy them up. Are the bulls crossbred or pure? Pure Angus is really. Pure Angus and another one how often should the bulls be changed over during the service period? Someone here is currently swapping teams of three bulls in and out twice a week. 
Yeah, no, you probably need to do it more often than that. We're looking at doing it every every day, really. Okay. Daily. So we're going to see you swap your know. three teams. Yeah. Swap yeah, your three daily. teams around. Yeah. One at a time. James, Wallace, go first. So swapping the using yeah the teams are three bulls but swapping them every day really so you're you're they're getting two days off and one day on. Yeah, I'd say they they need coming out daily, um, and I've even got clients doing it every twelve hours. Um, two reasons for that: one, the bulls get some recovery time, which if you're in housing on autumn systems is critical. The other is it makes a profound impact on the libido. If you watch what bulls do when they first go into a group, they go crazy. If you watch what they're doing 24, 48 hours later, they're having a snack while there's four bulling cows on the other side of the yard. Uh, they yeah. just get quite quickly. So keep rotating to keep that, that momentum up. Perfect, thank you. I am very aware of time. We have a couple. James Wallace, have you got anything else you want to add or ask just now? No, no, no. Right, for the last couple of minutes, I am just going to do a one quick fire answer questions. So we have AI technician coming in at 9 a.m. Is it worthwhile having two visits and what's the ideal time to AI? You did cover that slightly earlier on, so would you see another visit would be good? Yeah, you'll get a bump from twice a day AI. The only thing I would say is don't lose sight of the... Uh, uh, law of unintended consequences that time has to come from somewhere and if you steal it from heat detection you might actually lose performance in the process yep. um, a comment here heifer in cab rates expected to be 95 percent upwards this distorts the true herd fertility statistics comment anything like it should be different for the cows they they should be achieving those i suppose the only point is if you've got high proportions of heifers coming into the herd it it will distort the numbers but you just need to reflect on it okay and there was also another comment from someone who has a, runs a flying herd and their comment was lumping heifer figures into the statistics seems wrong so should we count them separately Oh, I mean, for me, they're not in the figures. You've only got carved heifers in the numbers, and once they're in the herd, they are a milking cow, and they're in the numbers. The heifer figures that are there are are calculated separately, and they're an important component of what you're adding to the herd if you're doing heifers. Thank you. Um, we have one more. We've got a couple of questions on protocols that we're going to have to leave today. One person here with 19 month old heifers born autumn 2020. They're going to serve them in spring 2022. How can they hold back the growth rates of that? Would your comment be to maybe build them sooner or how can they go about it? It depends on the logistics. If the parlor's there and you could cope with them, I'd be inclined to uh, carve them a bit sooner, like chop that gap in half and maybe have them a couple of three months early because you will retain them better for the following year in the herd, they'll have better fertility. Um, if you can't, then you know, you, you're you just gonna have to slow them down in that last six months, otherwise they're gonna get fat as pigs um, and just melt when they can't. Okay, Make guys. Them work hard and graze hard prior to uh, joining the Push them. Yeah, okay. Wallace, James, thank you very much. Dave, thank you very much. I am sorry we went over time. I don't like going over time. Um, if anyone has any more questions or comments, please do get in touch. We are going to give you a little bit of a few upcoming events that are coming in Scotland and nationally. Um, next week, on Tuesday the 2nd of February, we have Groundworks with Jimmy Goldie from Paris Billington. So he's going to be looking at soils whether or not to have sheep on, how we how we get everything ready for this growing season, both for silage and grazing. And then we also have some herdsman communication workshops, a little bit of what Wallace and James have done with, with their guys on the farm, but this is open to everyone. And they'll be run throughout February. The next strategic dairy farm events for Willie Bailey or all year round cabin herd will be 28th April, it'll be genomics. So he's genomically tested some heifers that are now milking in the herd so we're going to see how that all compares and the next time we bother Wallace and James is um, groundwork, soil and grass and that'll be in May so we've got a wee rest from us for a while and 
as always, anything else you need, please just get in touch with myself or Doreen. And we also have Dave, I'm going to send out your email address as well so you can get lots of questions after this. <laughs> I'm sure you'll love that. And there will be a follow up email after the webinar today. And it will have a link to the AHDB strategy that it could everyone just have your say on it to keep up now. And also a link to the KPI tool. And that refers back to some of the parameters that Dave was talking about in the presentation. It is free for you to use, free to access. And if you need any support with it, please just do get in touch. Everyone, thank you very much for your time today, and I shall see you all soon. Thanks. <laughs>